las tres palabras que definirían para mí el acceso a recursos genéticos y participación justa de beneficios serían futuro, negocio y sostenibilidad. Porque para mí el único futuro posible para todo negocio generado por cualquier empresa a partir de la naturaleza y los conocimientos tradicionales asociados es seguir el camino de la sostenibilidad y de la equidad. El protocolo de Nagoya está teniendo un impacto muy importante en el sector cosmético. Y es que hay que tener en cuenta que la naturaleza y los conocimientos tradicionales asociados a la misma son una muy importante fuente de innovación en nuestro sector. Y los nuevos desarrollos de ingredientes en el mercado ya están tomando como referencia este marco legal. Esto ha implicado muchos cambios en la cadena de suministros y mejoras a lo largo de estos años. Además, es importante destacar que la cosmética es una de las industrias que da mayor importancia y mayor valor a todos los aspectos de sostenibilidad de sus productos. La sociedad está empezando a demandar ya este tipo de productos y exige a las empresas fabricantes de cosméticos que actúen con los valores de sostenibilidad y equidad. Y en ese sentido, el cumplimiento del protocolo de Nagoya y de otras regulaciones nacionales y e internacionales de acceso justo es algo que la industria cosmética está ya empezando a aplicar y es algo que va a abrazar de una forma muy natural y muy rápida en los próximos años. El protocolo de Nagoya se encuentra todavía en sus fases muy iniciales, podemos decir que en su infancia, y tiene que crecer y desarrollarse hasta llegar a su plena madurez debe alcanzar un punto de mayor simplicidad en su aplicación para que sea realmente efectivo. Pero sobre todo, hay que hacer llegar a los consumidores el mensaje claro de lo que significa y del papel crucial que ellos tienen en el cumplimiento por parte de todas las industrias. Al final, no debemos olvidar que es el consumidor con sus decisiones de compra el que va a decidir el futuro de este protocolo. Y por esto es vital que los organismos responsables como el PNUD o las autoridades locales, eh, nacionales, internacionales, logren transmitir al consumidor este mensaje y hacer que éste exija a todas las partes implicadas su cumplimiento. Uh, happy birthday, Nagoya Protocol. We all had very big hopes. We all needed legal certainty about access. We all needed legal certainty about benefit sharing. We needed benefit sharing so that we could do sustainable use and conservation. And in the end, when we were confronted with the take it or leave it text by the Japanese presidency, we all agreed to take it. But I had sort of suspected that there would be an agreement the third time I came across the European Union and Brazil in a little huddle in an empty room, completely by accident. But then I knew there might be a breakthrough, there might actually be an agreement in the end. I think the most difficult part of it was really trying to reconcile expectations about benefit sharing with an attempt by uh, users to limit the scope of the protocol. And in my view, that was really the big mistake that we made, that we created a very narrow, a narrow instrument that doesn't actually cover all of the utilization of genetic resources that takes place and thereby created an incentive to bypass access and benefit sharing legislation. When it came to implementation, when people started putting in place ways to obtain legal access, there were incentives to avoid that legal access. And I think that's one of the things that we need to fix going forward. <laughs> para proteger nuestros conocimientos tradicionales, nuestros territorios, nuestros recursos naturales, biológicos y genéticos. Por una participación justa. Por el respeto a los pueblos indígenas. Por la autonomía de los pueblos indígenas y originarios. Por la defensa de nuestros derechos. Que se sigan Peloso. haciendo protocolos comunitarios en cada pueblo indígena. Tratar la pelota dentro de los pueblos por protocolo comunitario. Que se les dé voz a nuestros pueblos indígenas. Dos, tres. ¡Feliz aniversario, protocolo de Nagoya!
Welcome, colleagues. Welcome to this uh, session, last session of the global ABS conference. My name is Alejandro Lago. I, I'm the manager of the UNDP Jeff uh, Global ABS uh, project. Before starting, let me uh, give you some logistics um, instructions, indications for this uh, session. So this session is being recorded and will be available through the global ABS community, the community of practice of the UNDPGF Global ABS project. During this session, participants' microphones will be muted, but will be able to ask questions through the Q&A functionality available at the toolbar located at the bottom of your screen. Participants' questions will be addressed after the panelists' presentations during the Q&A section as scheduled. To continue the discussions um, on the topic of this webinar, please visit the Global ABS community and leave your discussion on the forum section. Finally, this session will be conducted in English, but there is also available interpretation into French and into Spanish. So please select in the bottom, at the bottom of your uh, screen, um, in the toolbar of Zoom, interpretation, and you can choose the channel that you want to, to follow, okay? Ahora en español, este seminario web posee la opción de interpretación simultánea al español y al francés. Por favor, asegúrense de seleccionar el lenguaje de su preferencia en el lado derecho de su barra de herramientas, en el botón que pone interpretación, y ahí podrán seleccionar el canal en español, porque la mayor parte de la sesión será en inglés. So now, Again, welcome to this fifth and final session of the 2020 Global Conference on Access to Genetic Resources and the fair and equitable sharing of the benefits derived from their utilization, commonly known as ABS. This conference is co-organized by the UNDP GEF Global ABS Project and the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity in collaboration with the governments of Japan and Jordan and other partners. We initiated this conference that today comes to an end almost a month ago on 29th of October that marked the 10th anniversary of the adoption of the Nagoya Protocol. During this month, we had time to celebrate the adoption of the protocol and to hear the progress made in its implementation in the last years in more than 13 countries around the world and also from other right holders, indigenous peoples and local communities last Wednesday, and the key STA holders, private sector on 11th of November, and from researchers in a marathon of three sessions uh, at the regional level on 4th November. Today, we will hear first from the donors, capacity building institutions and initiatives, and other international instruments to understand the way they have supported the implementation of the uh, ABS principle and the Nagoya protocol in the last years, and also to hear their views for the coming years. After that first part of the of interventions, we will have a short presentation from the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity on the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework negotiations to better understand what is coming in the next months and to identify the entry points to really make a difference and ensure that the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework project us into the ABS that we all need. 
we will conclude the session and the conference with a final panel with the panelists of the first session of the first part of the session and some colleagues from previous sessions as well as some special guests to commemorate this session today with me we have mr taukondo senshi congo who is the abs senior program manager for the abs unit at the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity. How are you, Tauko? Are you ready for this final session of the conference? Please. Leandro, after a uh, marathon of uh, events uh, throughout this month, I think I'm ready. Perfect. The floor is yours. Please lead us through the first part of the session. Um, well, uh, as uh, Alejandro has said, uh, in this part, we are going to look at the role of multilateral and bilateral cooperation in terms of key capacity building agents and other international instruments in the implementation of the Naga Protocol. This would uh, be taking us for around 45 minutes, after which we then proceed. And to kickstart our uh, deliberations today, we have Mr. Toshio Tori, Director General of Nature Conservation Bureau, Ministry of the Environment of Japan. Japan, through the Japan Biodiversity Fund, has been instrumental in supporting adoption and implementation of the Nagoya Protocol last 10 years. With a total funding of about 4 million US dollar, the Japan Biodiversity Fund supported the process leading to the entry into force of the protocol. The fund has also promoted ratification by countries and helped parties to understand the requirements of the Nagoya Protocol, including the ABS Clearinghouse, to strongly and continuously support the implementation of the protocol. Uh, may I now ask for the message to be screened? Happy 10th birthday, Nagoya Protocol. I am delighted to have this opportunity to deliver my message on the final day of this conference to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the adoption of the Nagoya Protocol. I experienced the COP10 process firsthand 10 years ago. I feel honored that Japan took leadership in finally bringing the parties to the consensus on the Nagoya Protocol after many years of staying I still remember the powerful emotion I had at the time of its adoption, as if it were yesterday. Japan has lived up to its commitment as a president of the COP10 for the implementation of the Nagoya Protocol. Internationally, he contributed to the establishment of the two international funds, the Japan Biodiversity Funds and the Nagoya Protocol Implementation Fund. These funds have provided the various types of support to developing countries, such as the establishment of domestic measures, technology transfer to conserve genetic resources and utilize them in a sustainable way, and encouragement of the participation by the private sector. Through the discussion in various sessions of this conference, we learned that the concept of ABS has been steadily building among the stakeholders since the adoption of the protocol. This is one of the most important achievements of the last 10 years because it requires mutual efforts and understanding by private uh, providers and the users of genetic resources. On the other hand, in the governmental negotiations, the parties tend to overlook voices from the field and the what is happened on the ground, as well as the original purpose of the ABS, which is to contribute to the conservation and the sustainable use of biodiversity. So I wish to call on all the parties to continue dialogue with various stakeholders through an opportunity such as this conference. Let us discuss what we should do to implement the protocol fully, as we are needed to aim for the realization of the 2050 vision. 
living in harmony with nature. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have heard from Mr. Toshio Tori. Let us discuss what we want the protocol to do. Next in line, we have Mr. Hugo Shali, who is the head of unit of the multilateral environmental cooperation in, uh, in, in, in the environment of the European Commission. The EU, together with Japan, has been one of the main donors of the Secretariat activities on ABS in the last 10 years. The EU has provided funding for many of the expert meetings, as well as some of the studies requested to support the deliberations by COP MOP on many different issues under the protocol. Also, the EU has provided temporary funding for hiring some of the staff working on ABS at the Secretariat and to support capacity building activities for the implementation of the protocol. Mr. Hugo, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Taco, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And I think I can only uh, echo the words of uh, my Japanese colleague underlining the importance of this conversation that we're having here. I think the EU is supporting programs, projects and initiatives to strengthen cooperation around the globe in a wide range of policy areas, including environment. In doing so, the EU seeks to create a partnership of equals and wishes to build a real and fair partnership with countries around the globe. The political agenda of the current president of the European Commission, Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen, contains an ambitious environmental agenda with a strong focus on biodiversity. This is a recognition that the protection of the environment, biodiversity and its components is essential to ensure sustainable development. The EU is therefore strongly engaged in supporting the implementation of the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing worldwide. Wide. To pursue this objective, the European Commission has been supporting the work of the ABS Capacity Development Initiative since 2012. We see the Nagoya Protocol as a key instrument for the full implementation of the CBD objectives, as well as an important contribution to the achievement of the overall Agenda 2030. In our view, the full implementation of ABS measures will contribute to the achievement of a number of SDGs, in particular SDG 15, by promoting the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. The implementation of ABS throughout the entire value chain can also play a role in creating opportunities for sharing knowledge and innovation and promoting development. The EU and its member states have now gained several years of experience with the implementation of the ABS regulation. The instrument was adopted uh, to implement the compliance measures of the Nagoya Protocol. Awareness about ABS has increased significantly across and among EU stakeholders, and a system to monitor and check on users' compliance has been set up in the member states. This has already brought home the message to us that implementing the Nagoya Protocol, both on the user and on the provider side, means setting up a complex system that requires capacity building at both users and providers level. We therefore stand ready to continue to cooperate with partners to progress in the implementation of the protocol and ABS measures. Since the uh, adoption of the protocol, we have financed and continue to finance capacity building activities to support the ratification of the protocol worldwide, to promote and support the development of legal frameworks in developing countries, to facilitate the development of institutional mechanisms to get IPLCs involved in ABS domestic processes, to assist developing countries in understanding better the compliance provisions of the protocol, and also to further develop their negotiation abilities when it comes to mutually agreed terms. We have chosen the ABS Capacity Development Initiative because we care about the approach of capacity building projects. And in particular with ABS, it was important to have has a long-standing experience with ABS and has an inter-institutional participatory inclusive secretariat 
and we'll certainly stand ready to continue to do so for uh, finalizing the work on a, a global biodiversity framework and its implementation in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Charlie. Implementing ABS for both or measures for both users and uh, providers will require a complex system. And making that system work will require capacity building. Uh, that was Mr. Hugo Shelley, and we proceed with our talks today. And I now give the floor to Mr. Suhel Aljanabi, co-manager of the ABS uh, initiative. Um, the ABS initiative was key during the negotiations of the protocol supporting the African group. And since 2012, it extended to all members of the African, the Caribbean, and Pacific group of states. The ABS initiative is one of the main actors providing capacity building support to implement ABS worldwide. And as such, the Secretariat and the ABS initiative share a long history of close collaboration throughout the last 10 years. Mr. Sohel Aljanabi, you have the floor. Yes. Um... Thank you very much indeed um, um, for providing me the opportunity to, to speak today. And um, uh, hello, colleagues, um, Royal Highness. Uh, what I would like to do is to guide you a little bit through um, the experiences gained by the ABS uh, um, initiative and uh, also to um, underline a bit uh, what, uh, uh, what we are and where we're coming from. Um, I wonder whether you can see my screen now. Um, all right. And um, so um, actually, uh, okay, thanks. Yeah, so now it should work. Um, so we are, and, and that was already mentioned by um, uh, Hugo Shali, a multi donor initiative uh, where one of the key donors is indeed the European Union through the ACP uh, Secretariat. Um, the, sec the initiative is hosted by uh, the German Federal Ministry of Economic uh, Cooperation and Development and we have also further donors um, such as the government of Norway and um, the Swiss uh, Secretariat for Economic Affairs. It's been implemented by GIZ, uh, um, German Technical Cooperation, and as uh, Dr. Shikongo has mentioned there's a long-standing um, relationship also with the CBD Secretariat and during our existence uh, already uh, since 2006 also a couple of other donors were on board which I don't want to mention but I think it's worthwhile mentioning um, that the track record of the initiative dates back then to 2006 supporting mainly the African group in the negotiating of the protocol with technical assistance, then um, a period of uh, supporting not only Africa, but also the Caribbean and uh, Pacific states in the um, ratification of the protocol itself. Um, and then, uh, and which is probably the most tedious part, is now uh, supporting the implementation of uh, the protocol itself, basically at three levels. So we uh, are looking at um, support uh, to the development of national and institutional uh, regulatory frameworks, so architectures, but of course laws and regulations. It is um, to um, promote as pilot cases, but also value chains, uh, um, ABS agreements, uh, ABS value chains that are compliant um, with national laws and regulations and in both the development of the national frameworks, but uh, also in the um, agreements to ensure that um, indigenous peoples and local communities are adequately integrated. And uh, just to mention some of the hows, uh, we, how we're doing that, it's of course then uh, with a focus on partner countries, coaching, um, um, it is uh, then trainings, it could be on legal trainings, valorization trainings, um, communication trainings. Then, of course, a lot of good practices are already being um, 
uh, developed and uh, so that's also a peer-to-peer -peer exchange on good practices. Um, regional harmonization is quite key. We know about the transboundary nature of many resources and of traditional knowledge. So there, for example, um, um, the, the support of the African Union guidelines on harmonized uh, implementation of the protocol was uh, one of uh, um, the success stories maybe a capacity development on emerging issues um, that's of course currently the big elephant in the rooms um, uh, the the digital sequence information and then of course uh, support to the coordination of, of regional groups so that provides uh, in a nutshell um, the the approach and I think um, uh, that map shows you nicely um, where the initiative uh, is directly working so in the African, Caribbean and Pacific region um, with the individual states partially to big extent now of course parties to the Nagoya protocol but also with regional organizations, sub-regional organizations um, with a view to more uh, harmonization at regional level. Um, we are uh, further working through um, the uh, structure of German bilateral development cooperation, so other projects that are being funded by, by, um, by BMZ um, uh, in our uh, intervention region, but also worldwide, as you see, the green um, uh, uh, shaded countries. So uh, all this, of course, supports um, uh, the exchange of good practices, but of course of, of lessons learned. So there's a, a huge interaction also that we are trying to facilitate between all these countries in terms of knowledge generation and so on. Now, um, within these 15 years, what are the main lessons learned and uh, challenges that we have um, uh, identified? I mean, definitely what one can say, there is no one size fits all for capacity building, capacity development. And I believe we will hear that also from our UNDP colleagues with whom we are, of course, also working together quite closely. So a custom fit support is key. Why is that key? Because um, um, some countries are already now in the revision of their uh, existing uh, laws and regulations um, uh, where it is uh, uh, to put focus on efficiency questions where others, of course, are still at um, the very beginning and uh, where support would be then uh, to support, uh, to, to, to help drafting um, regulations, sometimes only interim regulations, so that at least something is in place um, uh, that um, uh, can be a reference point for ABS. Um, countries are very, very different in terms of governance, land tenure, um, whom do uh, the, the resources belong to? Who would be the negotiation partner? I mean, all this needs to be uh, reflected in, in national laws, but of course in, in mutually agreed terms. And uh, just to take one example, the involvement of indigenous peoples of, uh, and local communities in some countries, um, they are uh, <clears throat> fully integrated, have full constitutional recognitions, but in others, there are no legal provisions at all, and all this needs to be taken into account. So once again, no one size fits all, tailor-made approaches are absolutely key, and this is time consuming, and this requires, of course, getting acquainted with um, uh, country realities <clears throat> to um, a very um, extent. Um, technically, um, what we can say is that still, um, negotiation of ABS agreements, the development of clauses is, uh, is uh, um, uh, problematic as we have so many sectors, so many issues that need to be taken into account when, when going uh, to, to, to mutually agreed terms. There is also a general lack of contract lawyers um, that are integrated in, um, uh, the, uh, in mutually agreed terms, in particular at the level of uh, the providing countries where mainly public lawyers are um, then asked to, to do that job. But of course, we all know um, that contract law is um, a world of its own. Um, that goes alongside with um, uh, the uh, question of um, to understand the negotiation partners. So R&D, intellectual property, business models and value chains 
um, how they're structured in the different sectors that would, which would need, of course, then to the one or the other way be reflected in which you read terms. And um, of course, based on that also to develop valorization strategies uh, at country level for genetic resources, biological resources, and, uh, and also um, traditional knowledge. Um, another thing that struck us is that only few countries are, uh, at least in, in, uh, in the ACP region, are um, um, building up uh, a bottom-up approach. Many are waiting, so to speak, for the bioprospector to, to come. So there are only few, like South Africa, for example, that are uh, developing or have developed kind of indigenous biodiversity economy policies. And uh, with that also support schemes for local business, for um, uh, SMEs, um, so that they uh, themselves can access international markets based on their biological and, uh, and genetic resources and uh, be, of course, then ABS compliant in, in that regard. Um, further, uh, it is good to see that at least the uh, key process drivers of um, ABS in particular providing countries now have attained a general understanding of uh, um, the ABS uh, mechanism, the Nagoya Protocol. Um, there's still some issues, Hugo mentioned them, uh, like understanding the monitoring and compliance system, ch uh, checkpoints, what is the role of the different documents, understanding utilization, I already meant that, and there in particular questions of third party transfer, benefit um, sharing related to different uh, sectors. Um, um, there are uh, still some, some substantial gaps, but uh, what is really a, a tedious, but very, very important question is that the relevant line ministries in the countries um, quite often only have a limited understanding of the Nagoya Protocol and the comprehension of its scope and also its sectoral development impact. So um, this is what um, really um, is uh, where much more capacity development is, 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 is necessary and not only focusing on um, the ministries of environment, but all the other ministries that are necessary to build up a functioning uh, ABS system um, in the uh, in the parties, uh, be it for pathogens and health, the interlinkage to the international treaty, and so on. Quite sure that Kent will some words on that. There are other um, deficiencies uh, that are um, not necessarily of technical um, nature. So what we see is that many of the officers in charge are simply having too much on their plates in terms of themes in terms of workload. Some are at the same time um, CITES, CBD, Montreal Protocol, Nagoya Protocol, uh, focal points and uh, uh, running this as one man shows. So this is um, uh, something where capacity institu institutionalization at, at the level of uh, uh, the countries is, is um, really a challenge. And that comes of course, along with two other aspects. It is that uh, there is uh, quite a high number of fluctuation of personnel. So once someone is trained and then leaves because he or she got promoted, um, then because of, of the very limited uh, um, uh, staff, um, it, uh, it, it, it turns into problems. And uh, another aspect is that for many countries um, to work together um, with the private sector, from the public um, uh, sector view, uh, from the ministries of environment is quite often new territory that's not necessarily something uh, where they used to and where then also contracts uh, are, are being set up with uh, um, with these uh, with, with companies for example their expectations and patience and frustrations on the one hand of course a big frustration and problem is that um, now over 15 years, uh, the initiative is, uh, is supporting ABS implementation, but we barely see now uh, monetary, non-monetary benefits flowing. It is starting, one can say so now with the implementation of the protocol and now uh, systems um, are becoming functional. But uh, of course, politicians, donors are asking 
uh, and rightly so. Now, so much has been put into capacity building, but where are the benefits to the people? And uh, where is, of course, then the outcome, the positive one for um, conservation of nature and um, uh, for, for sustainable use? Um, these are questions that uh, IPLCs are uh, equally asking. And um, uh, there, of, there, of course, there's industry, there are uh, small, medium enterprises, big enterprises that are to some extent uh, frustrated by the slow pace of, of the implementation of the protocol, turning away, looking for other uh, options and, and um, alternatives, uh, uh, not bearing in mind that, of course, it takes quite some time to build up these systems in order to be functional. But there's, of course, also um, uh, a positive side. We are seeing um, uh, that ABS is turning into practice. At the level of the EU, the EU regulations on monitoring and compliance really were a game changer uh, in terms of awareness raising at industry. And uh, so um, there are more and more access demands at the level of providing countries. Uh, this makes um, uh, focal points and competent national authority much more responsive, asking us much more case-specific questions. We do see that industry through the EU regulations, but also, of course, developments of codes of conduct are now uh, um, setting up standard operational procedures. How in their business models um, ABS can be linked at which stage in sourcing, in legal compliance, and so on, ABS would play a role. And um, also, um, there are new pro programs uh, in terms of supporting actors, uh, like, for example, the um, ABS compliant um, biotrade in southern, southern Africa and bioinnovation Africa. Uh, um, programs by, uh, supported by BMZ, where then uh, small and medium enterprises and um, indigenous people's local communities are being supported either sector-wise or partnerships between Europe and, and Africa. We do see at the level of the global markets now trends, uh, more demand for natural products. Um, there are very nice stories that, that can also help uh, marketing of, um, of ingredients uh, that are relevant um, or, and stay in relation to, to ABS. Um, whether we want it or not, and we all saw it when um, comparing it with the picture of uh, the speakers in the beginning, um, we're facing aging societies. And uh, of course, there is um, uh, a lot now R&D un undertaken on natural products in particular. In, in, in that regard, so there is, a, um, there is an increasing market, but also the bio and circular economies, waste use, biotechnology um, are drivers uh, to, to access resources. And uh, once um, the um, frameworks are in place, less transaction costs, we can foresee that there will also be, of course, more uptake, more benefit sharing also at the level of emerging markets, regional markets, uh, which are not only the old industrial ones. There is, um, now turning to, to what we have directly in front of us um, with the uh, Global Biodiversity Framework, the post-2020 agenda, there's a rethinking within the CBD, the interplay of the different um, objectives. And um, there is also, in particular, and Hugo mentioned that as well, at the level of the SDGs, um, um, a, a very strong link. Um, I would almost say that with the third objective, uh, um, the CBD is best suited to contribute to the um, sustainable development goals and um, the uh, Agenda 2030. I mean, we all know about um, uh, Goal 2 and Goal 15. Um, this is very obvious, but of course, if there is each and every goal we do see, be it in the promotion of rights, be it an SME development, be it um, and the linkage to climate change, or um, if it comes to ecosystem services and so on, there are um, uh, linkages to, to access and benefit sharing to the different R&D um, sectors uh, that are covered by the Nagoya Protocol and, and also other regimes. So I think this is something we would need to explore much more in, in future and also in the further uh, development of uh, the global biodiversity framework, this very linkage and the role of um, 
ABS within, within the framework contributing then to the Agenda 2030. Well, to conclude, um, there are uh, two, maybe two papers that, that uh, have, have here relevance, uh, um, which is the, the policy paper uh, of the initiative that has been uh, launched a couple of years ago in Cancun, which shows then um, the, the conceptual linkage between the different targets uh, of the F SDGs with, with, uh, with ABS. And there is, of course, now it has been put on the clearinghouse today, a brand new um, study, a handout, the contribution of um, ABS to the Sustainable Development Goals, where 20 cases had been looked in depth uh, from all regions of the world, um, how they contribute to the SDGs. And what I find interesting in that um, um, uh, study um, being um, supported by the German Ministry of Environment and the Federal um, Agency for Conservation of Nature is that a lot of lessons learned and how to can also be found in this um, uh, new publication uh, and uh, Secretariat, our longstanding partner, thanks again for putting it on, on the clearinghouse. I don't want to miss out that, of course, there was a very interesting um, other um, uh, a publication by the uh, uh, by UNDP also uh, on on that linkage bet uh, between ABS and genetic resources, but I'm quite sure that Santiago will make uh, a reference to that. So uh, that's in a nutshell, 15 years of experience, and yes, happy to answer questions in um, the uh, discussion round later on. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Mr. Al Janabi, that was quite a nutshell. You have identified a range of challenges, stakeholder capacity, uh, institutional deficiencies, expectations, impatience, frustration, but also having a positive outlook that we are being provided for the CBD post 2020 agenda 2030 being one of those. Um, we were now supposed to listen to Mr. Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, the CEO of the Global Ingram Facility. Uh, and unfortunately, due to uh, something uh, that came up urgently, he could not be with us today. And uh, we do recognize the GAF as the financial mechanism of the protocol, and that plays a key role in financing and supporting ABS implementation, first through the Nagoya Protocol Implementation Fund and later through the star allocation and regional global projects such as the UNDP GF Global Action Benefit Sharing Project. Uh, notwithstanding that, we shall proceed and move on. And um, we now give the floor to Dr. Santiago Carrizosa, who is the global lead on access to genetic resources and benefit sharing uh, at UNDP. UNDP as an implementing agency of the GAF has been a key partner of the Secretariat in supporting implementation of the protocol in many countries at national, but also at the global levels. UNDP has been very successful in linking ABS into national sustainable development plans, strategies, and as well as integrating ABS as a key instrument for the achievement of sustainable development goals. And with that, I now give the floor to Dr. Santiago Cari Sosa. Thank you so much, uh, Talco, uh, for this kind introduction. And uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening to all colleagues, your Royal Highness. Uh, I would like to start by congratulating the Global UNDP GF ABS project and uh, and the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity, and of course, the governments of Japan and Jordan for organizing this global conference on ABS, which has facilitated interesting discussions between key users and providers of genetic resources during the last uh, four sessions of the conference. So um, today, the uh, conference organizers are asking me to describe the role of UNDP 
in the implementation of the Nagoya protocol. And uh, I have to say that UNDP's role in the implementation of the Nagoya protocol has been a fascinating journey, a true partnership between countries, UNDP and the GF, which uh, has supported not only the global UNDP GF ABS project, as Tauco said, this project is being managed by Alejandro and his team, and they've been doing an excellent job. But UNDP has also supported and is supporting ABS projects in about uh, 45 countries or so. And this partnership uh, basically goes back to um, 2012, when we started supporting uh, national ABS projects funded mainly by the famous Nagoya Protocol Implementation Fund. As you may remember, these national projects brought together users and providers of genetic resources who contributed not only to develop ABS products for the pharmaceutical, cosmetics, and food industries, but also to strengthen national ABS frameworks. As you may remember, the Nagoya Protocol Implementation Fund came to an end in 2014 and we continue supporting countries with resources from the GF Trust Fund. And um, our job uh, is pretty much focused on supporting implementation of the strategic framework for capacity building and development of the Nagoya Protocol, which uh, was adopted by the first conference of the parties of the protocol in October 2014, as some of you may remember. So, in this context, we're working with countries on three main broad and comprehensive areas. First, uh, we're developing and strengthening legal and institutional capacity for national ABS frameworks that comply with the Nagoya Protocol. Second, we're working to build trust between users and providers of genetic resources so that they engage in biodiscovery projects that deliver monetary and non-monetary benefits and contribute to the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. And third, we're strengthening the capacity of indigenous and local communities to contribute to the implementation of the Nagoya Protocol. Also, with the support of the global UNDP GF ABS project managed by Alejandro, we have a global community of practice on ABS, which serves as a knowledge sharing platform. Here we have, uh, for example, um, an ABS clinic that provides um, advisory services to governments and other stakeholders on any topic related to ABS and the Nagoya protocol. Uh, but I think the most interesting question today is, what have the projects achieved at the national level during the last eight years or so? Uh, and the response to this question can be found in a publication titled uh, ABS is Genetic Resources uh, for Sustainable Development that we launched in late uh, 2018. This publication was produced with the support of the GF, the Republic of Korea, and the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity and the publication showcases 27 biodiscovery stories of how traditional knowledge, science, technology, and human ingenuity have been used to develop novel products from genetic resources. Um, I don't have a lot of time today, so I, I would like to mention at least one of these stories that came from Argentina, where researchers from the National Agricultural Technology Institute are working on the development of a treatment against the virus that causes severe diarrhea in children. This virus is known as the uh, rotavirus A. And um, it turns out that the wild guanaco, which is the Argentinian cousin of the camel, generates an antibody known as a nanobody which is effective against the rotavirus. And the project, the project is currently working on a methodology to demonstrate that the rotavirus can be neutralized by the nanobody of the Wanaco. So if they're successful, they could develop a treatment against uh, pediatric diarrhea, which is currently killing over 200,000 children globally every year. So this is quite significant. 
By the way, another significant achievement of this project came early this year when the expertise of the project team was tested with the COVID-19 pandemic and they used their knowledge and equipment acquired with the project funds to isolate nanobodies from the domestic llama, which are effective against COVID-19. This is very significant. So the next step is to take this outcome to preclinical and clinical trials. And the team hopes to develop an inhaler that administers uh, nanobodies that could prevent or treat the respiratory infection caused by COVID-19. So this is indeed breaking news, you know, and this news was shared by the ABS uh, project team of Argentina during the second session of the global ABS conference on November 2nd, as some of you may remember. And this is so significant and interesting that I just wanted to mention it again uh, today. Finally, I would like to say that, you know, this publication, ABS is Genetic Resources for Sustainable Development that we launched in late uh, 2018, unveils the potential of genetic resources to develop new products for the agriculture, crop protection, pharmaceutical, personal care, and food industries. And this publication also demonstrates that the future for the sustainable use of biological and genetic resources is here. And I'm very happy to report that based on the findings of our projects, we're beginning to see more and more research organizations from developing biodiversity rich countries that are using genetic resources for the development of ABS product, products. And this was not the case 10 years ago when the Nagoya Protocol was negotiated by the international community. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Carisosa. Again, quite a lot of uh, interesting insight. ABS is genetic resources for sustainable development, and through our discovery, human ingenuity and others, we can find ways to get meaning and benefits out of um, ABS that can then help us to conserve biodiversity. It was also interesting to know that you mentioned that some of this work may and can be relevant to address current challenges that are facing us, such as the COVID-19 pandemic. And also that researchers from developing countries are also now entering the field in terms of uh, our discovery Etc. Thank you. Uh, we have our last speaker in this part of our conference today, and it is Mr. Kent Nandosi, who is Secretary of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. The International Treaty and the Nagoya Protocol share the same objectives. And as such, both secretariats have been working together during the negotiations, as well as the last 10 years, to ensure that implementation of both instruments is mutually supportive and that benefits are shared, contributing to conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. Mr. Nandosi, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Tauko, for, the, for this opportunity. Uh, Your Royal Highness, uh, friends, colleagues, uh, it is indeed an honor and pleasure for me to be, uh, to join you today. And uh, quite a pleasure also to see a number of old friends um, uh, online. I know Tauko and uh, Hugo, who have been veterans of the negotiation of the protocol, uh, who are known for, for such a long time. I'd like to congratulate the uh, UNDP Jeff Global ABS project for what they have achieved so far uh, within uh, the short time. Uh, also recognize the huge work and impact that um, the ABS capacity development initiative have, have also uh, made in the process of uh, uh, the transition from text to concrete, you know, implementation and practice of, of the protocol. You know, when um, 
the protocol w w w was adopted. You know, we, or in fact, when it was being negotiated, of course, we followed the, the whole process and shared some of the pain, the frustrations, and also the subsequent elation when it was finally adopted. It was indeed a, a huge um, um, uh, and a, a major landmark in the development of and for the implementation of the objectives of, of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And, and since then, the Secretariat of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture has been working very closely with the Secretariat of the Convention and the Protocol in various activities that support both mutual supportiveness, but also at, that, at the earlier stages to promote the uh, uh, ratification and early entry into force of the protocol because we recognize that there was need for, for this uh, protocol to enter into force as early and as quickly as possible because of the fundamental role it played in uh, achieving the uh, objectives of, of, of the convention. Following that, we, uh, you know, we, we conducted a number of joint uh, activities and initiatives which included capacity uh, development activities uh, uh, and this was based on a memorandum of cooperation that I signed several years ago with the Executive Secretary, uh, which was intended to continue and entrench, uh, really uh, codify the institutional cooperation that we have between our two secretariats, that's especially in capacity development activities, uh, we do with access and benefit sharing. As Taoko indicated, I said, uh, uh, we shared some objectives. In fact, the objectives of the treaty uh, mirrors exactly the objective of the convention, but with a special focus on sustainable agriculture and food security. Uh, since then, we have continued our collaboration, uh, which it includes a number of partners, the ABS Capacity Development Initiative being one of them, as well as um, uh, the uh, Biodiversity International. We have all uh, had tripartite uh, activities uh, among ourselves, and I'm pleased that this cooperation continues to flourish and it's been growing over the years and we look forward to continue to to build build on what we have achieved so far but there's still a lot of work to be to be done and uh, looking forward uh, in fact starting from where we are today i mean we can see that the global pandemic that we're all experiencing right now clearly reminds us the common vulnerability of humankind and the interdependence they will have with, with nature that the more we abuse and misuse and destroy nature, you know, there's a backlash and there's a price to pay. Because only through understanding, preserving, working with nature and living with nature in harmony that can we survive as a species. And because there's a common interdependence with us and nature, of course, there's that interdependence between all nations, between all human communities. And that global challenges such as the pandemic, but also issues of conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity as a whole, requires much more co cooperative, collaborative, and multilateral approach to deal with the challenges that are arise from them. And, you know, the COVID pandemic has reinforced that, you know, this reality and that fact. And that this bi and the biodiversity is the system that supports life and abuse it at our own peril. In this context, I think the, the ongoing negotiations of, of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework provides an incredible opportunity you know, to establish a universal agenda and a framework for action, and we should not miss this opportunity. Uh, in our, the governing body of the International Treaty at this last session, you know, and, and pardon, even before that, had explicitly requested both the Bureau and the Secretary of the Treaty to engage actively in the negotiating the discussions and preparation of the post 2020 and then speak on behalf of our parties in order to ensure strong contribution from the treaty community in the development and implementation of a new framework including through the cooperation with other uh, biodiversity conventions we certainly see it as an opportunity and uh, that it provides to further enhance coherence and cooperation between the treaty, the CBD, and the Nagoya Protocol. And in this regard, we have certainly been fully engaged and contributed, made inputs during the process of the negotiation, but we'll continue to do so. And we'll certainly look forward to further engaging and collaborating with our partners and 
uh, both um, in the secretariat, but also uh, the uh, Nagoya Protocol, com uh, larger Nagoya Protocol community. But in looking forward, uh, as we develop a range of policy options to to what implement the protocol, the treaty, but also how that will reflect be reflected in the uh, final uh, post twenty twenty framework, we must recognize that the linkages between biodiversity, food security, human health, especially by adopting the One Health approach, which uh, I think is a globally recognized uh, idea and concept, and everybody is converging on agreeing on. But of course, uh, the, as I say, the devil is in the details and how to, uh, and the approach and the, and the, uh, and the details to, to work, work it out and reach that goal. Uh, in the end, I think it's extremely important with whatever framework, especially in the post-2020 framework that will be agreed, but also in the SDGs, the successor um, goals in, in the SDGs, because we know that the SDGs that and decided the targets written to access beneficiary in the SDGs expire this year. If there are any successor goals, it is important that we maintain and strengthen these targets on access to genetic resources and the fair and equitable sharing of the use of benefits arising from their use. And this will include the mutual supportiveness of the respective instruments that, that deal with, with this issue. So colleagues, friends, I would say brothers, the Secretariat of International Treaty remains, uh, remains fully committed to continuing our close collaboration and the broader engagement with the convention, the protocol, and will continue and remain a key partner with the Secretariat in promoting coordination and implementation of our respective uh, agreements. Thank you so much, Dalko. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mondozi. You have outlined a number of important things, recognizing the linkages between biodiversity, food security, health, and other sectors and also looking at uh, as a number of initiatives are coming to an end in 2020, what do we do going forward? You've also stressed the need for cooperative, collaborative and synergistic efforts given our common vulnerability and interdependence as a species both to each other, to one another and to the systems out there. Thank you very much. Uh, Alejandro, shall I let you handle the uh, 15 minutes of questions and answers? Um, what we are going to do is just to have the questions and answers, uh, all of them uh, at the end, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much for this uh, first part, it has been really uh, interesting to to hear from this very selected group of panelists uh, who have shared with us uh, very important experiences. Let me take the opportunity to, uh, as you indicated, uh, Tauko, to remind participants that you can write your questions to any of the panelists uh, under the Q&A section at any time, and we will uh, address uh, them towards the end of the session, okay? To conclude this conference, we need to look ahead and better understand the exact process of negotiation that will take place in the coming months. And that should lead to the adoption of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. Ms. Gillian Campbell, Head of Monitoring, Review and Reporting at the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity, will now introduce the process for the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework negotiations. So Gillian, you have the floor. Thank you. And I, I think that somebody's going to share my slides. Awesome. Um, so I'm really going to talk mostly about the monitoring of the Global Biodiversity Framework. Just in terms of the Global Biodiversity Framework, I, I believe that probably most people know that this is something that is being developed now. There's a lot of negotiations on what should go into the Global Biodiversity Framework. Um, and the, the idea behind the Global Biodiversity Framework is that this framework is not aiming to just capture the 
the Convention on Biological Diversity, but it's aiming to provide a framework for everyone for how do we achieve our biodiversity goals as a planet. And so it's not only about the parties, it's not only about what we do at the CBD, but it's about where do we want to see the world in terms of all of the things, all of the interactions between people and biodiversity, in terms of how we protect our planet. Um, and, and it should provide a framework that everyone can sort of latch onto so that you would have the private sector, um, you would have NGOs, you would have individual citizens that can use the, the global biodiversity framework as a guide for where we want to get to in the future. Um, and what I'm going to really talk to you about today is the monitoring of that framework. And so similarly in ambition, the monitoring framework is not aiming to, to really focus in on specific you know, sort of small issues within the framework, or it's not aiming to focus only on what the CBD is doing. It's aiming to provide a monitoring framework that countries can use and that the global population can use to see how we're doing in terms of actually moving towards our biodiversity goals. There is now, just as of Monday, a draft um, document on the monitoring framework, which is online. And so I provided a link on this slide. Um, hopefully this will also be shared with you so that you can go and read that in more detail. Next slide. So, sorry, there's a lot of text on this slide. The idea behind the monitoring framework is that we are hoping to have a set of headline indicators that are, are actually mandatory in the national reporting to the convention, and that these headline indicators would be high level, not too many indicators, not creating a burden for, for countries, but that these would represent a very, you know, sort of the highest level of outcomes and outputs that we are expecting on biodiversity. Um, so an example of a headline indicator that's proposed is natural ecosystem extent. So, you know, this would be the sort of sum of all the different types of natural ecosystems and, and tracking the extent of that sum over time. Um, and then, and then this would be something, as I said, that we would hope that countries can get behind. This is a, a change in the approach from the past is that these indicators are really being proposed for countries to use so that the ownership is not with um, global data providers, the ownership is not with, you know, sort of big research institutions to track these, but it's really with individual countries to say, how are we doing? And then we aggregate that up to the global level and we see how we're doing as a planet as well. Um, and then we're also proposing a number of more detailed indicators, which um, would allow people to drill down and, and find out more information. In the context of ABS, I will show the indicators that we're proposing. And so again, at the, at the headline indicator level, we're not aiming to, to track how projects are faring. We're not aiming to track the inputs necessary in order to, to track ABS. We're aiming to track how are we actually doing in terms of equitable sharing of benefits? Um, how are we actually doing in terms of equitable access? So not we're not really tracking so much what needs to happen to get us there, but are we actually achieving where we want to be in terms of ABS? Um, and then I just wanted to say we have in the global biodiversity framework, there's two parts of the framework. There's four goals. Those goals of the global, global biodiversity framework are sort of a vision of where we want to be by 2050. And these represent the state of biodiversity, including how it interacts with people. So again, it's not about the actions that are going to need to take place, it's only about the state. Then there's 20 targets, and these 20 targets do relate more to action, but very high level action. Um, so an example would be something related to reducing pollution might be an action. Or, um, you know, protected areas is, is one of the targets. And, and so in developing the monitoring framework, we've tried to mirror this and make sure that there is this delineation between these state indicators and, and more of the action indicators. And we are also then trying to balance aspiration and feasibility in the monitoring framework. Um, as I mentioned, I mean, this is a big change from the past where we're really trying to get countries to, to measure and to include information, quantitative information in the national reports and in, in their NBSAT planning and in their approach to, 
to all of the different areas related to biodiversity, in, including, of course, the Nagoya Protocol. And so we need to have a set of indicators at the headline indicator that the countries can actually measure. At the same time, we want a set of indicators that is highly, highly relevant that actually tells us something interesting. And so we're trying to find that balance. And I'm not saying that we necessarily found it in the document that has been shared, but that's the goal. And so I'm hoping that you know, we can work together um, as a community to, to refine this over time. And in that, we have proposed that there will be an expert group established so that we can further refine and make sure that this monitoring framework can be operational. Next slide. Um, I kind of already mentioned this. Uh, as I said, the headline indicators is aiming to be a minimum set of indicators that's necessary. In the framework, there are less than 50 indicators being proposed. There are 11 being proposed to measure the goals um, because there's only four goals, you know, so that is uh, a, still a reasonably small number. And two of those are related to ABS. So, you know, you're talking almost 20%. And then the same is actually in the targets. In the targets, there are 36 indicators being proposed. Most targets only have one indicator. Some have a few more than one. And there's actually three related to ABS. So I think that of all the topics, ABS is probably the one that has the most headline indicators currently in the, in the framework. Um, but we'll see how this makes it through the discussion at the SAPSTA. And then uh, the component and, and more detailed indicators will be released. It should be that the paper is currently with our editorial services, so it should be online uh, as an addendum within the next few days. Next slide. So I'm just going to show you what's in this paper so that you know what we're proposing. Um, and so the, the two indicators that have been proposed at the headline level for measuring ABS are the amount of monetary benefits in United States dollars received by countries from utilization of genetic resources as a result of an ABS agreement, including traditional knowledge. So this, as we've heard in some of the previous presentations, this would require that there is a system in place for, for tracking ABS agreements. Additionally, we would only be able to really measure what has come out of a formal agreement. And so benefits from ABS that are not formally registered, would we would need to, to further work with parties. And I, I would hope that or, you know, groups such as this could work to make sure that we are maximizing what we, what we collect. And um, the disaggregation of this, and I think that there are quite a lot of IPLCs online is that we would hope that we would not only look at the amount of monetary benefits, you know, per country, um, but also by beneficiary groups so that we would break this down and say how much of this actually benefited uh, IPLCs, how much of this benefited organizations that are focusing on a, a gender angle. And so that we would be able to have some sort of disaggregation in the framework. And then the second one is the number of research and development results or publications shared as a result of an ABS agreement. Um, and it, it's similar breakdown. I would say on this, we had a lot of discussion on, you know, what do we want to really say here in terms of, of non-monetary benefits. And the reason why we focused in on results and publications is because it's something that's that seems to be more measurable than some of the other types of benefits that might, you know, if you're talking about a project document, it would be impossible for us to try to track down all project reports that have been produced. So we really need to focus on, you know, formal publications because then there's already existing mechanisms for tracking publications. Um, and so this is the, these are the two indicators that are currently being proposed at the headline level, and there's more being proposed at this more detailed level, which you'll, you can see online. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, I'll show you the proposed headline indicators for target 12. Um, I would say that the, the goal level indicators are sort of more high level than the, than the target indicators, which probably came out of what I've already said. Um, and this is the target, of course, that re re really directly relates to ABS also. And so here we're looking at the number of users that have shared benefits from the utilization of genetic resources and 
or, and or traditional knowledge, um, the number of access and benefit sharing permits, uh, and we have proposed an indicator, which is kind of cut off, I see, on the extent to which legislative and administrative or policy frameworks um, ensure fair and equitable sharing of benefits. And so this last one is the one that I think it links to an SDG indicator, but instead of just saying the number of countries that have legislation, what we're doing is we're trying to make this a little bit more of a subjective assessment. So this is something that where we as a community would need to develop a methodology so that you don't just say yes or no, we do have something in place. You say, yes, we have something in place and it it covers this much of the scope of what we would want to cover in terms of ABS and it covers, you know, it's this well developed. So it would be a little bit of a subjective ranking in terms of how well developed we actually think that ABS is being covered in the legislative, administrative or policy frameworks. And we're hoping that this would then, you know, give countries a way to parties a way to self-assess how they're doing in this respect and then to make improvements and identify gaps in terms of their, their policy frameworks. And so that's the, the purpose of this last indicator and, and probably one of the more interesting ones I think for the participants in this workshop because it would give us something to try to develop in terms of how do we actually assess how we're doing in terms of these policy frameworks and how do we use this indicator as a way to provide advice on on improving. Next slide. So in terms of the next steps, um, this is, as I said, the paper is online and then the more detailed paper will be online soon. I mentioned in the in the actual pre-session document for SAPSTA, we're proposing a text a technical expert group to guide the process moving forward. Um, my view is that, you know, having good indicators, making sure that we're monitoring properly, it does take, a, it takes time and it takes real consideration and it's not something that you can just sort of do quickly and then wash your hands of. And so I'm proposing that we establish a group to guide this process and that group would then be responsible for identifying how each indicator can be further developed, how each indicator is really going to be rolled out and also for providing advice on how the capacity building needs around this monitoring so that we would have an idea of how do we actually operationalize this and how do we maximize the uptake, not only in national reports where we're proposing that the indicators would sort of be mandatory or at least highly recommended, but also how do we get these indicators used, not only in NBSAPs, but in development planning more broadly? How do we get these indicators in, integrated into the, the national development plan for the country or into the country's approach to SDG implementation? Um, and so this is the group that we would want to establish. So the SAPSTA will review this proposal and the proposal for the group. Um, Right now, it's looking like the SAPS is going to meet in, in January uh, as a, a first online meeting and then have an additional meeting soon. I don't yeah, I know. Things are very up in the air, as everyone knows, due to the current situation. Um, but anyway, eventually the SAPS will have a, a ha make some recommendations on this guide on this document, which will then be sent for guidance to the open ended working group and finally to the COP where we are hoping that the monitoring framework will be an actual annex to the global biodiversity framework. And so this would really elevate the, the role that monitoring the monitoring framework has because it would be officially part of the framework. Um, next slide. And so that is it for my side. Sorry. No problem, Gillian. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, so that's it from my side, as I said. <laughs> Thank you, Gillian. Um, and as we, there are, well, thank you in particular just to put into context the framework, no? not only as an instrument um, for the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Nagoya Protocol, but um, as a strategy that should be applied horizontally no, in different areas uh, and therefore should be um, followed by other departments and should be fully integrated in, into other policies, right? 
Um, and we have different questions in the Q&A related to your presentation. So um, I'm sure during the Q&A, we will have the time to uh, address them, okay? But I think they go actually in that direction that you were mentioning right at the beginning of your presentation. As we enter this second part of the session, I would like to invite all the panelists to turn on your cameras. So Amber, Lactitia, Marcus, Jennifer, as well as the previous panelists, I would like you to turn on your cameras just for this final uh, panel. And to start with uh, this final round, we have with us a very special guest. For me, a true champion on ABS, Her Royal Highness Princess uh, Basma bin Ali of Jordan, who is the chairperson of the National Committee for Biodiversity and founder of the Royal Botanical Garden of Jordan. Your Highness, it is a pleasure to virtually meet you again, although it is a pity that this has to be a virtual event due to the current COVID-19 pandemic, as we should all be in Jordan celebrating this conference. Let's hope that in the short future, we can have a similar event in your country to enjoy its incredible world heritage places, landscapes and nature, as well as the generous and kind hospitality of its peoples. Your Highness, you have been very much involved in your country on the conservation of biodiversity, and in particular on the development of policy measures through the National Committee for Biodiversity and the Royal Botanical Garden. In your experience of these last years, why do you think biodiversity conservation is important and how you see the role of ABS into this uh, broader uh, biodiversity picture? And as a second part of my question would be, uh, what in your experience and in your view would be the needs that you would like to highlight for ABS in this post-2020 biodiversity negotiation process uh, and for the next years? Uh, first, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you so much for having me participate with everyone. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the government of Japan, as always, uh, for hosting us, and of course, Jordan. Um, <clears throat> and to thank all those who worked behind the screens um, in having putting all this together. I know it's very difficult in this new way of doing things. Um, Going back to the biodiversity conservation is of the utmost importance on two levels. The first of which I really, really believe in and I think should be at the forefront of everybody, regardless who they are as, as a global citizen, is the non-utilitarian perspective, where, um, as I said in the start, in the beginning, that uh, from my Islamic background, that we are custodians of the earth. We have to take care of it for the next generation, not just to use it and benefit from it. And this I go back again and I repeat um, in reference to the charter that uh, King Abdullah uh, II has uh, drafted in recognizing the rights of flora and fauna uh, of species and ecosystems. So with this mindset that they do have an equal right to exist on earth, we should put that at the forefront of any protocol, any convention um, uh, on, on levels. Now, the second part is uh, regarding the importance is basically that without the diversity of our biological resources, um, humans cannot thrive. And Mr. Kent so eloquently just mentioned now that we have a common vulnerability of humankind. And this we have to recognize if we want to go forward. Um, the emphasis really is at the diversity level because we can't aff afford to lose any more species, especially in light of the SDGs and uh, food security. Now, the role of ABS is one of the very most important uh, mechanisms that we have at hand. Yes, it took 10 years or more to develop, but to sustainably manage our genetic resources uh, <clears throat> such that both the users um, and, uh, or rather the, the beneficiaries 
uh, of our genetic resources, acquire it in a legal, sustainable manner, which they have, of course, signed the Code of Conduct, uh, which ensures providers, uh, communities, their rights uh, uh, that have been uh, respected. And of course, it's with all the mutual um, agreed terms and so on and so forth. But this is something that we have to bear in mind that um, very often that we say that the, the local communities or indigenous people have been bitten before and we have to build that trust. And this trust doesn't come overnight. And yes, you know, sometimes when, when we, we develop this ABS and we were trying to promote it, one of the things that we faced as a region here was the lack of trust from those to buy into the ABS because it was such a big thing that nobody knew the, the details of it. And this is, we have to work on the public awareness, be it on the um, decision-making level all the way through to the consumer level who ultimately can aid us in, in achieving this goal. Um, and here I would like to highlight, for example, if we take Ethiopia, um, they've had a prime example in how the trust uh, to build between those who have taken their resources and used them. And as to yet, um, as far as I know, the benefits of which have not been shared as expected, or they've been very, they're frustrated in getting their benefits um, so far. But for us, in order for us to, to gain the trust and really implement the ABS as we would hope to, and not take another 10 years to do so, we need to take heed of two elements. Um, and the first is to capitalize on our existing successes because, or achievements rather, because so far such that the momentum doesn't slow down. Uh, we've come a huge, we have achieved a lot. But if we slow down now, and if the, the resources, monetary resources or funding um, trickles, become smaller, we would have, it would be, be near impossible to regain what the momentum that we've, we've already um, done or achieved so far. And the second is to mobilize and to support and to coordinate efforts between all the stakeholders um, it's not just those who use the resources and those who provide the resources or traditional knowledge, but um, on all levels. For example, if we take Jordan, uh, for example, it really took a lot of effort to try and convince the decision making the importance of what is ABS, the importance of biodiversity. And had it not been for the international support in, in terms of Jeff or UNDP or even the CBD, we wouldn't be where we are today. So I really do appreciate their support on that level. Um, but there's another light or, or different thing I would like to add, which is uh, a, a level of hope. For example, uh, the Botanic Garden Conservation International, um, which is the largest network of botanical uh, institutions has been working on the ABS and is currently developing a range of ABS uh, tools, support tools. And they've developed a web-based platform, or they're developing actually, a web-based platform which is based off its uh, current plant search um, database for the responsible exchange of plant uh, genetic material while of course flagging the ABS within that tool. And it will also integrating, it will be integrating biosafety and CITES compliance and, and all the requirements um, by collection by uh, collection by collection in botanic gardens. Now, um, and BGCI, they're also developing a certification scheme to accredit institutions for ABS, best practices and compliance. So you can imagine how helpful there will become these will become an, 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 an importance in monitoring institutions' compliance because this is something, as mentioned earlier by the other panelists, that uh, it's one thing to put out all the, the rules, the paperwork, and so on and so forth, 
and raise the awareness but how um how will the institutions or the different stakeholders really comply this is how because it's a dynamic process it's not static it's not like a list that you can tick off and say we've achieved the bylaws we've implemented this and that but it's actually giving it life and ensuring it's implemented the way that we want so i think we have a very good tools in our hand and and um and i would like to say a quote the general secretary of vgcis he said there will no longer be an excuse to exchange material without the necessary uh, regulatory compliance really because we have so much so many tools in our hands but here i would need to add that the donor support is so important to upscale our efforts and raise again i say the awareness just how essential and i really do use the word essential abs is to the future of humanity not just certain um, countries but all of humanity and quite frankly if we learned anything at all from covid 19 it is that when there is genuine will to change the way we behave we most certainly can um, last year proved that business as usual can be easily changed nearly overnight to a new norm um, if it ensures a better future for with the, you know for the all of humanity and with this le lesson i urge every institution to develop its principle on access to genetic resources, not just rely on the governments and, and so on. It really has to come from every single institution or all stakeholders. And with this, I would like to use one last example, which is the IPEN. I don't know if anyone's, if you've heard of it, but it's the International Plant Exchange Network, which established a system to facilitate the exchange of uh, a network um, of, of material for a network of gardens and this has been developed for non-commercial can you imagine non-commercial use of living collections so it's not always under the umbrella of the commercial use of our genetic resources but even non-commercial uh, use of that um, and this is true commitment really to ensure the benefit of everybody so in conclusion my message is that this is a global issue uh, which has to have a global response and uh, responsibility uh, the donors must support the need uh, to build and develop capacities and um, it's been mentioned on on all levels of how these capacities are and also not to rely solely on countries on the governments but also um, on the private sector and to build that bridge between the two and local communities and understand that if we don't do this today and if we fail i don't use fail but i have to but if we fail to do this the future of tomorrow will be very 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 different one that we would be ashamed to look in the faces of our grandchildren and our children and say oh sorry we used up all our resources we have a couple of crops here and there and you have to deal with it this is the reality if we do not implement um, the abs properly and even hopefully the global um, biodiversity framework because we put you know over the 20 somewhat years i've seen all these targets all these ambitious ideas come forth and we all get excited during the conferences and we say yes we're going to do it but then when the time comes and the deadline arrives we say oops sorry we didn't quite make it so the one lesson we can learn from covid is if we truly want to make change and truly affect be effective it has to come uh, completely genuinely from every single person on the planet uh, not just one sector and i always feel i'm always preaching to the converted already in these conferences but we have to increase our visibility 
um, using social media, which is a perfect platform, and use whatever there is out there to mobilize the youth, and to be inclusive, including gender issues, and really um, be as dedicated and vigilant to the way this go for, goes forward. Um, and here in the end, I would like to also thank again the UNDP and Jeff, because had it not been for their support, uh, Jordan wouldn't be where we are today. So I thank you so much. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Your Highness, uh, for your very inspiring intervention. Thank you for reminding us that we are in a critical situation, uh, but that we have to be uh, not just only positive, but committed, no? and mobilizing all the actors, all the society, to make possible that uh, transformation and uh, change. No? Um, and knowing that that change is possible, no? if we generally uh, push for it. No? Thank you so much. And please, you are not only our uh, super special guest today, but you are a panelist. So please feel free to interact uh, during the rest of the panel with other panelists. So request the floor as much as you as you want, uh, as much as you need, okay, during the rest of the of the panel. And let me take also this opportunity to uh, congratulate and thank uh, the support uh, from our colleagues uh, in UNDP in Jordan because they have been uh, superb in the implementation of this project and they have been providing us uh, incredible materials, no? fantastic videos uh, from um, the different uh, locations where the project uh, has been developed, in particular with local communities, with the Association of Women in those local communities. Uh, so thank you very much to our colleagues uh, in Jordan that I know they are following the, this, this event. Uh, let me move on to another very special guest, as uh, she could not participate in the previous uh, sessions. Um, uh, let me introduce Ms. Jennifer Tolin, who is the representative of the International Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity. Uh, Jennifer, you are based in the Philippines, so thank you for joining us today for this session. It must be close to midnight already in that part of the world. And we would like to start uh, transmitting our solidarity with the people of the Philippines after the series of eight devastating typhoons that have been passing through the country in the last two months. We hope you and your family are doing uh, well, are all in good conditions, and that the country is able to recover soon from this uh, dramatic uh, situation. Last week, we had a specific session of dialogue between governments and indigenous peoples and local communities, where it was clear that the Nagoya Protocol is an instrument that introduces and inter articulates some key indigenous people rights related to their traditional knowledge and genetic resources, but also that the implementation of the protocol is still in its infancy and the level of awareness of indigenous peoples about these rights is still rather limited. What is your experience in the implementation of the Nagoya Protocol and ABS? And looking ahead, what would be the most demanding need that you think has to be addressed in the ABS context from the IPLC's uh, perspective? Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, everyone from the ancestral territory of the Ibaloy Igorot indigenous peoples in the outskirts of what is now known as Baguio City in the Philippines. And thank you very much, Alejandro, for your well wishes um, and this opportunity to be part of this webinar on behalf of my indigenous brothers and sisters in the International Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity. Um, Recent assessments and studies, including the fifth edition of the Global Biodiversity Outlook and the second edition of the Local Biodiversity Outlooks, as well as the IPBES assessment on biodiversity and ecosystem services, have confirmed the role and important contributions of indigenous peoples to the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. 
this is not a coincidence. In fact, it is directly related to the close relationship of indigenous peoples with our lands, territories, and resources. And as you mentioned, Alejandro, um, uh, indigenous peoples were actively involved in the negotiation process leading to the adoption of the Nagoya Protocol. And as such, we believe that the protocol represents a significant advance in the recognition of the special relationship developed since time immemorial between indigenous peoples and the biological and genetic resources in our lands. So, um, as you mentioned, there are key provisions of the Nagoya Protocol. It recognizes our authority to grant access um, for uses of uh, traditional knowledge associated with genetic resources, but it also goes beyond by recognizing that there are situations where indigenous peoples have authority to grant access to genetic resources. It also recognizes the role of indigenous laws and community protocols and provides an opportunity for parties to designate uh, competent national authorities and focal points from among indigenous peoples, as well as um, support for aw awareness raising and capacity building. But as you rightly observed, most of these provisions are poorly implemented. So what kind of ABS do indigenous peoples need moving forward? Well, um, the obvious answer is that we want the protocol provisions relevant for indigenous peoples to be fully implemented. And this will ensure that our rights and the benefits derived from uses of our traditional knowledge and genetic resources will be shared equ equitably and help us in achieving sustainable development. So adequate and appropriate resources must be allocated for continued awareness raising and capacity building, as well as dissemination and documentation of community protocols. Um, for indigenous peoples that grant access to genetic resources and associated traditional knowledge, there needs to be um, technology transfer, as well as strengthened and continuing partnerships on an equal footing between uh, users and um, indigenous peoples. Um, we also note that um, there needs to be mutual supportiveness between international instruments. And in particular, we would single out the intellectual property system, which needs to be reformed so that it supports, it fully supports uh, the protocol and recognizes the rights of indigenous peoples to our genetic resources. So in practical terms, this means that relevant goals, targets, and indicators of the post-2020 framework should fully reflect the role of indigenous peoples. And I note with appreciation um, from the presentation of Jillian that um, you know, we are going uh, uh, a step in the right direction. So I hope that these indicators get confirmed by the Substa. Um, if there's one thing that we learned from the implementation of the IG targets, is it is that it, if something is not measured, it will not be implemented. So it's very important for these indicators to be there. And finally, implementation of the protocol needs to keep pace with technological advancements. Um, you asked about our experience um, with implementation, and we've noted that it's very alarming how easily genetic materials na material nowadays can be sequenced even in the field and the data extracted and shared. And we are very alarmed by how much genetic data, including indigenous uh, uh, genetic data, is already available online. Therefore, digital sequence information needs to be urgently addressed moving forward. And a global benefit sharing system should be finally established, as well as a robust compliance mechanism. And this will address, we believe, a very large gap in the implementation of the protocol. So um, the IIFB and Indigenous Peoples Worldwide are ready to engage, to realize the, fully realize the promise of the Nagoya Protocol and to truly achieve the vision of living in harmony with nature. And again, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer, just for making those points from the 
uh, as representative of the International Indigenous Forum on, on Biodiversity, um, key points actually, and, and you prepare uh, very nicely the introduction of the next uh, panelists. Let me indicate at this point that all the panelists have intervened and now we are bringing colleagues from previous sessions. So please, in the next interventions, feel free if you want to add a point or to counter argue or just complement any comment, uh, please feel free to do that. So kindly request uh, the, the floor and, and we will give you the floor. So uh, digital sequence information, a key uh, point, okay? And here, of course, I have to uh, call on our colleague, Dr. Amber uh, Scholz, who is the deputy to the director at the Leibniz Institute DSMZ, the German collection for microorganisms and cell cultures. Amber, how are you? You look younger. Uh -huh. <laughs> Alejandro knows I had a birthday. He's, he's teasing me. Um, Alejandro, I, I, I thought I would talk to you actually a little bit, not only about DSI, but about um, the academic research community and ABS in general. Can I do that or do you want me to? Absolutely. No, 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 no. I was just uh, connecting with the previous intervention. You were connecting me. Yeah, I'm like DSI girl, you know, because I love data and I love all these geeky things. No, um, I, was, I was just kidding. Uh, so we started the conference with a birthday celebration and we are lucky we finished with another uh, one. No, So happy birthday to you, Amber. And your institute is very much involved in mobilizing the research community to better explain how digital sequence information works and is being generated and used, and the need to get an AV assistant that contributes to stimulate research, you know? and of yeah. course, the generation of data, uh, while at the same time, ensuring the sharing of benefits. I know there are many issues that need to be addressed, uh, but if you would like to, if you would have to highlight the most demanding ones, uh, the most demanding needs, what uh, that could be. Exactly. So what I understood you wanted me to say and I was answer the question, what is the ABS we need? And I'm a geeky researcher, so I have to rely a little bit on slides to keep my thoughts organized um, and be brief for you. So I just wanted to, to, to put together three slides and say, I think the, the first thing that we could do as a global community, and this has been echoed by, by many of the colleagues here, is we need to learn from the past decade. You know, that's what an advanced uh, planet does, is to learn from mistakes, to iterate, and to move forward. What works, what doesn't? And as an academic researcher, I came up with three ideas here for things that are working but could work better. So the number one thing for, for me is simplify and standardize where it's possible. And I agree with Suhel in terms of the need to custom fit, but yet there are a lot of things where we could streamline and simplify. And, and, I, and my heart um, is in the protocol in particular for Article 8A for saying, particularly in biodiversity research, um, that we do need to look for simplified measures. And yet we find in our community that even if we're going out and we're studying endangered tortoises, um, and even if it's a UNESCO project to make sure that the national park works, we still have to go through the Nagoya Protocol. That's okay, that's fair, but it would be really nice if there were simplified, standardized paths to move forward on that. And then you ask us, Alejandro, well, what do we think that we as a community can do? Um, we, we have some examples and we've been collecting lists about things that work well, ways that we can standardize, ways we can simplify, and some, some glitches that we're hitting. Um, so some places where trust, I think, can be built, uh, particularly in the non-commercial sector. Um, we would love to partner and work with, with, with parties or with international groups that want to work on standardization. You know, the plant treaty, um, their SMTA is a great model. Are there opportunities for other parties to follow that model in the CBD or Nagoya space? Um, can we have more countries using IRCCs? You know, India does a beautiful job of, of putting IRCCs into the clearinghouse. It would be great to see other large um, countries where there's lots of research happening 
also to, to approach that, that standardized process and that transparency. So we would be really happy to continue to work with that. Number two, of course, for, for our sector, non-monetary benefit. It's like the, 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 the dirty stepchild in the corner. And it's a bit neglected if we're all honest with us. It's, it's not the most sexy thing. Um, and yet at the same time, we know that it's, it's costly. The, you know, our research grants and these partnerships and these, 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 this working together is Im important for capacity development. It can have very long lasting effects, but there's no money on the table. And I think, and I love these beautiful examples, and the nano um, antibody example is incredibly fascinating. And, and examples are how we capture the imagination, but it would be great to move beyond a set of case studies to now look for global data sets, global trends. And what Jennifer just said before me, you know, looking at indicators, measuring things, hoping that non monetary benefit sharing can be measured and change over time, that would be an incredible development for the next decade. And so, um, as was pointed out earlier, the, the um, exciting revelation of goal C 0.2 and target 12 is very exciting for our sector. So what can we do to support this? Well, it's hard to measure non-monetary benefit sharing. I think it's very encouraging to focus on research results and publications because as scientists, we know how to measure those things and we're getting really good with text mining and artificial intelligence to digest these research results and tell the world what came out of them. Um, and excitingly, we're, we're working on, on new projects and new methods to quantify these research outputs. And if there is a, a seat at the table in discussions, we would love to be involved in the GBF process, especially in the non-monetary benefit sharing space. And now, Alejandro, as you requested in my introduction, uh, digital sequence information, there are, we, we talked about it for over an hour on November 4th, so go back and look at those if you're interested. And of course, the Secretariat, together with the Capacity Development Initiative on the 1st and the 9th, are hosting webinars. So I don't want to waste your time there. But I will say my, my biggest wish for us as a community is to start with the data. Before we make political decisions, before we fall back in the trenches and, and we say this is our political position, let's look at the data, particularly when it comes to providers and users and ideas about who is that. And one of the things that I'm really happy to be working out on with other colleagues here um, in, in Germany, including the Leibniz Institute, IPK, and Gottesleben is to create a database, to create a platform that we can show you that actually every country in the world is a provider and every country in the world is a user of DSI. And that's a really powerful message that science can give you and it's also true data that you can put your hands on. So that was it, Alejandro. Thank you so much, Amber. Do you have any as quick as usual, interpreters will hate you, you know that. Oh yeah, I'm so sorry, interpreters. I hope most no, no, of you no, speak English. You are always uh, very enthusiastic about these uh, issues and you are really involved, so it's a pleasure to, to have you and to listen to you. And you uh, made a, a very good point that we have uh, tried to transmit all the time during the conference, that this was just um, the beginning of a dialogue, no? and, and that we need to, to listen to each other, um, to all the different stakeholders, and it's very important that governments no, uh, continue this dialogue at the national, regional, or global level in that process for the post-2020 negotiations. No? So I think yeah. that's, that's key, so to listen to researchers, to listen to private sector, to listen and engage with uh, and evolve uh, fully uh, indigenous peoples and local communities is key, you know, uh, to be successful in that process and for the posterior implementation, right? Not to have exactly. some paper that no one knows uh, that is very good, but at the end of the day, as uh, your highness uh, were indicating, uh, no one applies and is a uh, kind of uh, dead paper, no? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Amber, and again, you are also welcome to, to intervene on, on, uh, on any of the points that are going to be highlighted next. Um, and I just have two more panelists in my list. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Marcus Wies, who is the strain director of the Global Regulatory Affairs at DSM Nutritional Products. But even more importantly, in our context, 
Since 2019, he is the chair of the ABS uh, Task Force of the International Chamber, Chamber of Commerce. One of the sessions, as we mentioned already, consisted in a dialogue between governments and private sector, where we heard that there is a need of a bigger involvement of the private sector on ABS, but also we heard the demands from the private sector about more transparency, legal certainty, reduction of uh, transaction costs, and a request of certain level of uh, harmonization or standardization. Looking forward, if you had to remark the most demanding need from the private sector perspective to really achieve the ABS that we'll need, that could be, what could be? Many thanks Alejandro uh, for the lead uh, on what you expect uh, me to contribute. Many thanks also for the organizers of this webinar series. It has been very enlightening, uh, very nice to have those open constructive discussions. Um, it has been expressed in quite uh, many of the interventions today that the ambitions are really high, uh, that uh, we expect something similar to the Paris Agreement for Climate Change with COP15. And um, the private sector is seen by many as playing a crucial role in mainstreaming biodiversity. Um, therefore, we really highly appreciate to have the chance to contribute to those discussions and uh, to continue discussions also beyond uh, this meeting. Just to take the end at the beginning uh, and also linking to some of the interventions, mainstreaming to me means it must be simple. You need to be, easily, uh, to be uh, able to uh, explain it easily, otherwise it's going to be complicated and failing. So mainstreaming must be easy. I also chose to eventually share two slides and I hope they will come up um, soon. What um, seems then to be the main challenge for me, and uh, we heard a lot about moving forward, eventually strengthening instruments in order to uh, create more benefit sharing. Um, I strongly feel we also need to look at the challenges. And uh, this slide is obviously a caricaturization, but uh, is indicating quite a bit of it. In the discussions on ABS, obviously, you have many different stakeholders, all with different perspectives. And if you are not entirely clear on what we are talking about uh, and what we are meaning, uh, we will not understand uh, each other. So this is definitely one first claim. Uh, we need uh, to make all the efforts required to mutually understand our needs, our requirements, but also our red lines uh, that we are not uh, willing to step over. Secondly, in order to do so, I think what is crucial is language. That language is clear, is uh, uh, fully understood by everybody involved. And uh, I've particularly referred to DSI. DSI uh, indicated to be a placeholder only at this stage does not help in creating clarity. So also there, I think we need to have more discipline in really agreeing on what we are talking about. And the third aspect uh, I would then also like to highlight uh, with the next slide is that we should have a clear and consistent uh, framework in mind. And it is expressed, emphasized uh, quite often that the three objectives of the CBD need to be implemented in harmony, need to mutually support each other. This, there's nothing wrong about that. However, some are interpreting this to mean that the fair and equitable sharing of benefits would provide all financial resources to conserve biodiversity. And I think this is a conceptual error to say that a correction of harm to biodiversity already done is a sort of fair and equitable benefit sharing or is uh, uh, conceptually compatible with fair and equitable benefit sharing. So definitely, I think uh, we would advocate uh, considering uh, looking instead at what uh, might be termed a biodiversity house, where capacity development, resource mobilization, green finance, stakeholder engagement uh, are the foundation, and where the pillars of protection, sustainable use, conservation and restoration support 
reaching the overall objective, the full appreciation and respect for nature. It has been emphasized by some that there is no sustainable use without benefit sharing or the other way around. Benefit sharing is intrinsically an intrinsic component of what we truly consider to be sustainable use. On the other hand, for conservation and restoration, I think um, uh, what is missing in the current uh, context is eventually something like a biodiversity impact by based uh, contribution, creating incentives financially or otherwise to disincentivize activities doing harm to biodiversity. Looking at uh, the climate change discussion, obviously this is the pollute to pace principle that is implemented there and that helps to incentivize and move in the right direction. And just then uh, looking at the red dot in there, uh, as long as uh, we do not understand or we do not agree that uh, benefit sharing and whatever is uh, done on conservation and restoration uh, is uh, something uh, very different, I think we will have uh, very big differences in expectations that will make discussions uh, more complicated. So then, um, Coming back uh, to uh, your original questions, uh, so what uh, is uh, needed then to create uh, the ABS uh, system of the future, as said, um, uh, and also as also highlighted in the webinar two weeks ago, uh, where uh, there was the dialogue between governments and industry. Um, I think it was, uh, was good to see that even the poster childs in, in industry uh, being most proactive in, in, in going for access and benefit sharing, the cosmetic sector was actually uh, being uh, rather critical, saying yes, it can be done, it is done, it is serving the purpose, but uh, you also need to realize that supply chains are very complex and doing then the right things for all the supply chains is a daunting task from a, an administrative perspective uh, and so on. I would not phrase it the way as it was in the introductory video that the current framework actually uh, forces users or pushes users to circumvent the system. That is not the idea. Uh, however, I think uh, in our perception, it is clearly that the current setup of the access and benefit sharing system is Le leaning users to avoid uh, the hassles of uh, having a lot of uh, administrative stuff to do, not having the required legal certainty to be really sure that this what uh, is done is truly appreciated and is truly serving the purpose. Therefore, this uh, would be our uh, claim, our um, wish for the next 10 years as also expressed two weeks ago, that the future system uh, should take all the uh, learnings from the past 10 years into consideration. As mentioned by you, Alejandro, look uh, at the requirements of all the different um, stakeholders and uh, create a system that is simpler, more uh, easy to communicate and is eventually also better serving the purpose of sharing benefits. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Marcus, and thank you also for uh, bringing the most demanding issues from the, the private sector. Um, in particular, that uh, demand that is, I think, commonly shared by most of us, that we have to adjust the system at all levels to make it more uh, attractive and easy to comply with, no? for, in particular for final uh, users. And we need also to uh, mobilize uh, consumers no? into the system to, to understand and look for it as well, no? that the companies uh, widely apply and comply with the system. Thank you. Our last uh, guest today from uh, the previous sessions is our superstar from the ABS National Competing Authorities, uh, Leticia, who is the Deputy Director at the Department of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries in South Africa, also the co-chair of the Adopt Technical Expert Group on Digital Sequence Information on Genetic Resources. Lactisha, I hope you are okay. 
you have been directly involved in most of the sessions of the conference um, and from the government side and looking into the future what do you think is the most pressing need that you think requires it requires to be addressed Thank you very much, uh, Alejandro, for this opportunity to also contribute in this final uh, session of the uh, ABS celebration, the 10 years base day of the Nagoya Protocol. Uh, having participated um, in the previous sessions and, and also today and, and trying to uh, look forward into uh, the ABS uh, that we all need. And I, I think uh, the previous speakers have also touched on, on some of the uh, fundamental um, aspect that needs attention from all of us. Like for instance, uh, for us to be able to chart our way forward, I think we need to also look back into the, the past 10 years and, and evaluate ourselves in terms of our efforts uh, on, on the ABS uh, space. And, and you will see that um, our efforts were mostly um, pushing for the ratification of, of this Nagoya protocol and, and also to ensure that there is uh, national measures in place that are adopted by the various uh, parties, uh, parties to the Nagoya protocol because the Nagoya protocol in itself uh, it's not self-executing and it requires uh, extra effort from the various parties to put mm -hmm. in place measures uh, to implement uh, those obligations. And, and I think we need to acknowledge that um, we have not achieved um, uh, fully uh, our IQ targets. As much as we managed to get the required numbers of ratification to get the Nagoya Protocol uh, to enter into force. But uh, in terms of uh, putting in place uh, national measures to implement uh, the Nagoya Protocol, I think there's still a huge gap in terms of other countries that are not, that are still in that process of developing their, their framework. And I think in this session, some of the speakers were able to even share with us some of the challenges that are being uh, faced by the, the various countries as part of the capacity uh, development and, and, and support that they are giving to, to various countries in the implementation of the Nagoya Protocol. But however, having said that, um, um, it, it doesn't mean that um, utilization of the genetic resources uh, was on hold in the past 10 years. So access to genetic resources has been happening. And I think some of the speakers also uh, made reference to some of the case studies and the success stories. And I think South Africa also shared some of uh, our success stories in terms of the cases uh, that we have, that have gone through the ABS system and, and get uh, granted with permit. However, in that process of implementing the Nagoya Protocol on ABS, a lot of um, lessons uh, um, and, and the practical um, challenges, uh, they, they become uh, clear to the to the regulators because when you start implementing, then you are able to now see where the gray areas exist in the current system. And, and we see um, this post 2020 uh, process as another opportunity for the parties and, and the global communities to now go into this uh, process and, and, and work on this ambitious uh, goals and, and, and target, but I think they need also to be realistic in terms of how are they going to assist in terms of achieving 
uh, the, the objectives of the CBT as well as the Nagoya Protocol and also other relevant uh, multilateral uh, system because I think when we talk of ABS, it's not only confined to the CBT instrument and the Nagoya Protocol instrument. So there are other international uh, or multilateral instruments that also talk to issues of the CBT, uh, to, to the issues of the ABS. Uh, so we, we really need to find ways to come up with um, a very ambitious goals and, and targets. And I think one important challenge that we need to um, pose to ourselves is um, how are we then now going to measure uh, the impact of, of the ABS we all need. So I know we can, we have counted the number of ratifications. We know the situation in terms of legislation that are in place and the gaps that exist. But now the, the, the one question that I think we really need to ask ourselves is on the impact of this ABS, um, uh, of this ABS that we all need. And, and the impact is derived from the benefits uh, that are shared from the utilization of genetic resources. And when you look at that, we need to now start uh, looking at where are these benefits uh, sharing coming from. Are they coming from um, a bilateral arrangement? Are they also coming from multilateral arrangement? And, and those kind of things, we need to also look at it and see if uh, if we are looking at the multilateral system, uh, what, what kind of benefits are we looking at? And if we are going back to the bilateral system, what kind of benefits are, are being shared with the, with the uh, providers of, of such genetic resources? And I think Amber touched on a very much important elements of, of, of non-monetary benefits as something that is always not given attention and, and listening to that and, and what the Secretariat presented uh, on the indicators for uh, measuring um, uh, the non-monetary benefits in a form of publication of research and, and other aspects. So I still have this one question to myself and I think Alejandro also touched on it to say, yes, publication is one thing, but if, if we take the publication as a measure of impact in terms of the benefit sharing, I think we are going to, to be losing in terms of the actual benefit that is felt by the recipient. And, and in my uh, thinking around the non-monetary benefit, I usually want to uh, push it to a more practical way in, in, a, in, a, in a way that uh, a, a non, some of the non-monetary benefit, they do have a, a, a monetary value attached to them. And, and if, if an asset or a, 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 a publication is put out there and there's nobody who is utilizing that information or utilizing the asset or that has been transferred to the beneficiary, I think we'll still be having questions in terms of the impact of that benefit uh, that has been shared because some of these non-monetary benefits have, uh, um, they, they can easily become redundant and, and not be uh, felt by the recipients. I think I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lacticia, and thank you uh, just for uh, reminding us that we had a very basic, um, thank you, a very basic um, target in the in the HE targets for the protocol, which remind us that we were in, in our the infancy of the protocol and that we are now reaching a very crucial moment now for the protocol regarding what kind of uh, objectives, goals. Uh, and criteria we are going to establish and that we have in front of us a great opportunity to do it and we need to do it uh, correctly, we need to do it right. Um, before giving the floor to other colleagues and I, I see Suhel uh, Johan, I would like to make a, a point and I forgot before to mention that and some colleagues already uh, connected with that idea so allow me just to make a very short 
um, a statement regarding the, the involvement of the youth and voluntarism. Yeah? I think, um, and, and in the Global EBS project, we had uh, an incredible partner um, implementing the project, helping us uh, to implement the project in Latin America in particular, but also at the global level with the Global EBS community and has been United Nations volunteers. Um, believe me, I, I was not, um, before managing this project, I uh, did not have contact with the UMB um, and it has uh, brought ABS to another level in the countries where we have been working with uh, UN volunteers. Um, we have been able to reach uh, levels of society that before we were just focusing on the usual stakeholders. And I think voluntarism uh, has, uh, is extremely powerful and needs to be integrated in most of the biodiversity and ABS uh, um, projects, okay? And there are lots of materials uh, produced by, by UMB in, in our website and in the global ABS community. And I would like just to highlight uh, your, uh, to call your attention to go through that because I think it's a powerful element to be uh, introduced in our projects or at the national level when uh, supporting the implementation of ABS and the Nagoya Protocol. So uh, apologies for that uh, point from my side. Uh, it was not my intention to take the floor as a panelist, a uh, formal panelist, but to moderate. Um, so yes, I would like to call uh, to the previous panelists and I see Suhel and Hugo that you raise your hands. So please, uh, Suhel. Thanks, um, Alejandro. I wanted to pick up on this uh, discussion now on the indicators and, and the monitoring, which is a very, very crucial one. What Jennifer said is true. What you can't measure will not be implemented. And so we are at a crucial junction now to look at what is on the table with respect on what is that we want to measure and what is measurable. So on the one hand, of course, we see that coming now from the IG targets, what we measured there was an, yeah, an output indicator, right? So um, no tree, no conservation impact, of course, was linked and related to, to the IG target 60. But now, of course, we want to do better. We say there is something now in place and we want to measure impact. And um, there were also now in the chat some considerations on, of course, an increase in benefit. We want to measure this. But uh, there is a lack of baseline and there's a lack of instruments to, to measure that. And uh, um, there is, on the other hand, of course, and that's what Amber said, um, the, the question of uh, the non-monetary benefits, which to, in many, many regards may play even a larger role with respect to sustainable development than monetary benefits. And um, I don't know whether only a discussion at at Substar in a very formal manner would lead to the possible, let's say, creative results we need here. Yeah, of all the stakeholders, um, that all stakeholders are reflected. I mean, this is what Marcus nicely showed in his uh, um, in his cartoon, right? I mean, we are all coming from different perspective, and um, also with respect to measuring, maybe there will be some reporting burden. Yeah? So if, if we really went down that road to, to, to measure now in billion uh, uh, US dollars, the increase in benefits, we would need to have some monitoring checkpoints. And th those cannot be only the CNAs because to a large extent they will not be involved um, and at least not follow up on five years down the line what the business figures of um, specific contracts were. So this is where industry would also need to play a role in reporting. We know about the confidentiality in um, the mutually agreed terms, but other workarounds through industry associations, for example, to have aggregated data and so on. I think these are all discussions that we can't just put to Substar because there are neither the right people were there, I will be there, nor um, it's going to be the right forum to, to look at those questions. So my plea is, um, it could be a format like this, it could be 
um, driven by the initiative or with UNDP or with the Secretariat uh, uh, with the International Chamber of Commerce together, but we created really a kind of an of a forum to look how this can be addressed in a, in a meaningful way because we got time as a um, as a gift, additional time, but let's make use of it in order to get to some meaningful proposals in that regard. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Suhel. And, and I will connect uh, towards the end on your last point on, on how we can join efforts to continue this conversation on key points, because probably the informal um, uh, platforms will help rather than the formal ones. No? Uh, otherwise, if we put this directly on the formal ones, we run the risk that uh, is locked or is not uh, further developed. Uh, Hugo, you wanted to intervene as well. Please, you have the floor. Well, thank you. Um, and this was a very, very interesting afternoon. And I, I know that this event is now getting long, so I will try to be uh, counterintuitively short. And you know I can go for a long time if I'm, <laughs> if I'm given the floor. Uh, reflecting on what I've heard and perhaps uh, trying to bring a couple of, of very generic elements into the discussion for our joint reflection. I think the main point is to see uh, what will enable the ABS to play the role in reaching the overall objectives of the, of the CBD. Uh, what will be the contribution that ABS will make to an ambitious global biodiversity framework? I'm, I'm a little bit reversing the questions that were in the agenda, but I think it's, it's, it's important also to, to reflect in that way. Um, and we all agree that, that ABS goes beyond what we currently have in the Nagoya Protocol. And I think the protocol was an instrument that we all showed that the implementation of the bilateral ABS model is actually very Hugo? Uh, Hugo, I think we have some problems with your connection. You're a bit choppy. It's frozen, Alejandro. Yes, okay. If I may. Okay, well, you, you wanted to add something, so please. Yes, uh, trying to pick up, you know, on this question of uh, how can the post-2020 uh, global biodiversity framework help achieve the objectives of the protocol and picking up also on what uh, Hugo was saying you know, um, and, and reflecting on the kind of challenges that we have had uh, over the years implementing uh, these ABS projects and how can, you know, this post-2020 uh, global BD framework address these challenges. Uh, obviously, we have had many challenges, but I could reflect on three at this point that I think are quite significant. One is the, the, the limited mainstreaming of uh, ABS and ABS provisions into the uh, economic sectors of government. And this was uh, addressed and mentioned, you know, by Suhel and uh, Marcus, you know, and some other panelists. We have seen lots of difficulties at the national level for uh, ABS, you know, to be absorbed by the, the, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Commerce, the Ministry of agriculture. The second challenge that has been addressed in one way or another by uh, most of the panelists is the limited engagement, the limited participation of some uh, industries of the private sector, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, for example. And maybe another challenge that, that we have seen, you know, in our projects as well, is that uh, from the part of the government legislators, the legislators that are, for example, housed, you know, in the Ministry for Environment that is usually in charge of, uh, of implementing the ABS and the Nagoya Protocol, we have seen that there's a limited understanding on all the business models, you know, of all, of all the industries that use uh, genetic resources. So how to address these uh, challenges uh, from the policy perspective 
And, and this is something that could be recommended uh, by the post 2020 biodiversity framework is by, you know, and thinking, you know, from the policy perspective, it could be like the development of national uh, bioeconomy policies. And we've seen some countries that are already working in this direction, such as Colombia and Ecuador. And these policies should link, you know, should be linked with national ABS frameworks. Uh, and these policies, you know, could promote also the, the investment, could be focused on promoting the investment on sustainable use and biodiversity, uh, sustainable use of biodiversity and genetic resources. Uh, these could be policies that increase the capacity of domestic research organizations. Um, some of the uh, participants in this webinar, webinar have been mentioning the importance of promoting research in the South. And I think through this you know, national bioeconomy policy, we could address this. But also, you know, this uh, national bioeconomy policy could bring together the users and providers of biological and genetic resources. And uh, above all, I think this national uh, bioeconomy policy could contribute to the greening of the economy. And I would go beyond to decarbonizing the economy through these investments, you know, on the sustainable use of biodiversity and genetic resources. And I think that this would also facilitate a more clear linkage between the objectives of the CBD and the objectives of the Paris Agreement, you know, of the Climate Change uh, Convention. And I'll stop here. Thank you so much, uh, Santiago. Hugo, we lost you in the way. I'm not sure if you are connected and you want to try to convey your point. You can switch off your camera to see whether we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, I'm happy it on. So can you hear me now? We can hear you, yes. Okay. I was just saying when I think I lost you is that the experience of the last years has shown that the uh, bilateral uh, ABS model is quite challenging that the system proved to be rather burdensome and costly. And also we have seen that this heavy system has actually not mobilized and generated the significant uh, sharing of monetary benefit benefits. In addition, I think what uh, really came apparent in the last couple of years when discussing the issue of uh, the link of the ABS world to the digital world is that the world of science has moved on since the early 2000s which was the period when the vision of ABS, which is contained in the Nagoya Protocol, uh, was shaped. And, uh, and I think that uh, here we also have to see, and I go back to what uh, some of the participants in the panel have said, that the nature and the scope of the understanding of benefits has evolved, that benefits are now more uh, gen generic in the sense it comes from the multitude of information and knowledge derived from uh, these uh, 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 information that actually is accessible to the wide world uh, in, in that regard. So I think that uh, here we also need to see that the uh, existence of uh, a great number of domestic uh, ABS regulations, which greatly vary and differ among themselves, are sometimes discouraging the users or the potential users of genetic resources. And we probably need more standardized procedure uh, more model contractual clauses that we actually uh, uh, would be welcome and actually uh, promote more utilization, more uh, development, and in that regard, uh, more uh, scientific research. So scientific research, health, food uh, security, these are common and global priorities. And I think we sh should always look at the system where ABS is not hampering research, is not standing in a way, is discouraging, or uh, do not, for instance, uh, allow immediate exchange of samples in case of health emergencies, nor negatively impact food security. So in a nutshell, more simple procedures, more effective implementation and less cost. Perhaps breaking it down even more, we should not look for the perfect system, which is efficient to the last dot, dot but very expensive, and may actually generate more costs than benefits. So I think that is that those are a couple of things we need to think about. We also need to improve the connections with the first and the second objective of the CBD. So ABS can only work if genetic diversity is preserved. Therefore, the benefit generated should contribute to the sustainable use and conservation of biodiversity. So I think that all that makes it that 
uh, we need to really realize that the uh, ABS doesn't stand on its own. It is part of the three objectives of the CBD and that a global biodiversity framework that is truly ambitious and in the way that we would want it should actually look beyond the Nagoya Protocol, incorporate it, but also look at how do we actually fully uh, uh, bring the third objective of the ABS into uh, the uh, global biodiversity framework. So I think that uh, are only a couple of thoughts. I think I could go at great length into some of the specific issues that were mentioned, but I don't think that's the purpose of our undertaking today. Uh, thank you very much and apologies for the technical problems in the middle of my intervention. I hope my points came through clearly now. Very clear now. Thank you, Hugo, and, and no problem. That's part of the of the context and how we uh, proceed with these uh, virtual events. I see Gillian, you have been with your hand uh, raised for a while. So please, and after Gillian, I will move to Marcus. Thank you. I just wanted to come back to some of the earlier discussion and there was a lot of comments in the chat and I wanted to emphasize, and I think this has been, this point has been made a number of times, that in terms of the global biodiversity framework, obviously the, the goals and targets are still under development. And so, yes, the indicators are being proposed as some of the indicators that measure the most pressing issues related to biodiversity, but this could change over time. And from my perspective, this is the starting point. And, you know, in terms of monitoring in particular, we're proposing some indicators. Some of these need to be further refined. Some of these need to be further developed. Some of the things that I think in the chat were proposed that would be interesting to measure, we're not ready to measure yet. And so I think that, you know, we need to see the implementation of the monitoring framework and the implementation of the GBF as, as a longer term process where we all need to work together in order to, to figure out how we're going to measure and what we're going to do in the, in the most meaningful way. And so to me, it's not, you know, this, this document in terms of the monitoring framework, or even the GBF, it's not, a, it's not a done deal. This is really just the starting point and, and a way for us to work together moving forward in order to, to do something better and more practically in the future. So that, you know, as uh, Her Royal Highness said, we can actually make a difference and not be in the same situation that we're in now in 10 years. Thanks. Exactly. No, there have been different comments uh, and you have spotted them very well in the Q&A uh, related to what is coming. Uh, all the panelists mentioned also on the relevance of the uh, non-monetary uh, beneficiary, right? And how to address that. Hugo also made a connection and some of the questions, uh, researchers, on parts of the convention that are not fully developed or articulated like uh, Article 16, Article 19, so technology transfer, no? uh, how to really go into more detail and better trace uh, what is happening under ABS for no monetary beneficiary, no? which are key issues that need to be incorporated and need to be addressed. Marcus, please, you were waiting for the floor. Yeah, and I just would like to add uh, to what Hugo has said. Um, uh, he referred to that uh, compared to when uh, the Nagoya Protocol and even the CBD were created, there was obviously a lot of technological progress that could not be fully anticipated. I think that can be complemented, obviously, that there is a, at the same time also a development in public policy. And uh, one important aspect is uh, open access policy. Uh, to uh, genetic sequence information, but uh, to published information in general. Um, on one hand, this is seen as critical to secure the quality of scientific research, uh, but on the other hand, uh, it is also understood by quite some to provide more value to society. So again, I think looking at the system of the future, obviously it's taking all those developments uh, since the creation of the protocol into account uh, to build uh, the better system. Thank you so much, uh, Marcus, for making also those uh, remarks. Um, any other colleagues in the panel that want to intervene? Amber, please. Yeah, I have a, a couple of miscellaneous connections that I'd like to make. So Leticia was talking about um, you, you know, the, the challenges or the limitations that measuring publications and measuring research results um, 
could could provide. And I agree, it's it's perhaps somewhat of a narrow lens. Um, but again, as I've noted, I'm a data geek. And the cool thing about publications and research results is, is a couple of really practical things. Number one, you can establish a baseline because we have publication records over lots of terms and we have big databases where we can do the same thing. So be it data or publications. You also have all cool types of associated data tucked in there about the authors, about where those authors are geographically located, the countries they worked in, and sometimes you even have the mention of ABS agreements, you have the mention of the genetic resources and their unique codes and identification numbers like at our collection. And so they're really rich sources. And then if you can connect them to the grant agreements and to the amount of money that was invested and to the partners and to the institutes that have been worked at, it's a pretty cool little hub. So it might sound unglamorous and it's, there definitely are other good tools to, to measure non-monetary benefit sharing, but they, they're not as practical as some of these big data sets. And that, and that was sort of the reason that I think our community is very excited about using these, these global um, data sets and, and the ability to mine those in ways that haven't yet been explored. And, and I wanted to follow up again also on, on Hugo's point on, on the challenges of the bilateral system. And I'd like to just put a thought experiment Forward. So our institute and our research department, we're really interested in acetobacteria. So acetobacteria is a type of bacteria that you find in literally every single soil sample on the face of the planet. They're, they're, they're cosmopolitan, you find them everywhere. And what we like to do in our free time is go out and look for acetobacteria because they have an important role probably in global biogeochemistry and we're interested in how these elements cycle around in the clouds and in the soil and et cetera. So it turns out that, that some of them also make natural products. So there's maybe at some point also a commercial relevance, but that's not our immediate focus. And we're also really interested in collecting biodiversity. We're the world's most di diverse biological microbial collection. So imagine that I have three projects in three different countries and I work in one and I have to fill out seven permits with seven different authorities for different fees and it takes a year and a half to do. Imagine I work in another country where I only have to sign an MTA, have the partner there upload it into an online registration system. And imagine I have another one that's not at all a party to the CBD uh, and is complete open access. You can imagine that of those three countries, if I'm gonna continue to apply for grants, work these partnerships and invest a lot of blood, sweat, tears, that that very first example of a very complicated system starts to look over the years really unattractive and especially because as I mentioned I can find these bacteria in any soil sample and it's not that I don't want to work with that country per se but it just starts to get harder and harder to climb up that hill and I think to Hugo's point if when we can find simple standardized procedures to let us look at biogeochemical cycling in acidobacteria all around the planet because we care about yeah you know climate change etc then it's really helpful to encourage that researcher to do those global analyses and, and to recognize the differences that we're faced with right now. Thank you so much, uh, Amber. Um, any other colleagues in the panel that want to make uh, another point before I go back to you, Tauko, or yourself, Tauko, you want to make any point or bring any question that has been left in the Q&A section? Tauko, something to bring back yep. to the panel? Uh, not much. Uh, I think what uh, there was a, a request there or a suggestion of a poster that we consider having a global ABS award for it's true. Uh, to recognize uh, the achievers uh, 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 in terms of leadership and, and best practice. I, if I'm not wrong, I think this is the second time uh, such a proposal is coming up in this conference, uh, in this month. It's the same person, eh? Do you have to take that into account? Uh, <laughs> that I don't know. <laughs> no, but it's, it's, it's an interesting one. It's a very interesting one, I agree. Yes, and, and, I, and I think it's, it's one that we should consider. Uh, because uh, once people, uh, in other, I think there's the Equator Initiative, um, which has also led to a lot of uh, good things. 
And I think if we can think about that and, and if there are partners out there that can work with us to develop something for that, it would be, it would be a very good uh, suggestion. Then um, there was also the need for us to, to, to have a holistic approach uh, with concrete examples of success and failure when necessary, as uh, same person. But uh, that, that reminds me that there are still outliers uh, or, 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 or sec sectors that should be part of these uh, discussions that are not normally there. Those are your, the people that, that have to transform what we come up with into regulations. Uh, and then uh, 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 the lawyers, the economists, all those people that have actually on the ground to make sense of what we have assumed makes sense. And I, I, I'm not sure how we're going to bring that, in, uh, to bring that into, uh, into practice. Then uh, there was a question now about the post-2020, uh, and uh, I'll rephrase it by saying, are we on the right track? Um, will it get us to there, or we, do we need to sit down and reflect and say, what can we do differently, and why should we do it differently? Because if we always do what we always did, we will always get what we always got. Therefore, should we perhaps crush our assumptions that we have been working with until now, so as not to be crushed by our own circumstances? Because the circumstances may be very different from that what we have assumed. Thank you. My apologies, my pen. Um, thank you so much, uh, Teuko, for those reflections. Uh, before concluding, we have a couple of things to do, quite important. The first one is we would like to take a picture of all of us and we will try to, uh, so I invite all the panelists to turn on their cameras. Um, and we wanted to, if possible, which I'm not sure we will manage, try to hold hands, okay? Just to show that we are connected, that although we are distant at the moment, we are still working as a community and, and we are together no, on this. So let's try, I don't know if the, the a screen will allow us to try to show our hands or not. Uh, the other one, the other one, where is the other one? <laughs> so trying to hold hands if possible. And I hope someone is taking a picture from our teens. Oh, even better, the other way around, the other way around. Excellent. I hope someone is taking a picture. <laughs> Not to be is like somebody. for a couple of hours. Is it taken? I am, I am, I am, I am here. You did. Oh, yes, you got it. Thank you, Agustina. Uh, so, wow, Tauco, we made it. We have survived to this month of conference mm -hmm. with four global sessions and one additional session subdivided in three regional sessions. This that has been tough. 20 hours, 21 hours of conference with a total of 63 panelists, 33 male and 30 female, and 12 video messages from 32 different countries. What a conference, what a conference. So what, what's, what's next? What's next, Saoko? What, what is coming? I think uh, there has been a lot of food for thought that has come out of here. Uh, and then uh, now that we've celebrated, uh, we return our focus to what's ahead of us, the PSI. There were some comments about it there. I saw in Ember slides that uh, she reminded people that uh, on 1st of December, there will be a seminar on uh, DSI 101, and then on the 9th, we'll have one to look at the outcome from the Arctic report. And then sometimes in January, we have to look at the policy issues that are emerging out of the various ongoing webinars and, and ideas that are floating. So I think that will be the next one. And then, of course, the big one is the post-2020 uh, global policy framework. As I said before, many things are coming to an end now, uh, this year. And we have to rethink and ask ourselves, what are the targets? What are the goals? Where are we going? Because if we don't know the targets and goals where we are going, how will we know that we have arrived there if we didn't know where we are going in the first place? And I guess all of us have to ask ourselves, within all of this uh, visioning and planning, where does ABS fit? Does ABS fit? Should it be there? Should it not be there? 
Certainly, and, and I think the colleagues have already mentioned about the importance to continue the, the dialogues no, at different levels mm -hmm. in order to be prepared, fully prepared, fully mobilized, fully engaged no, with all the different stakeholders, uh, with all uh, society uh, as a whole no, involved uh, in this important uh, moment no, to take the right decisions, to do it right, because this is going to make a difference now in the future and, and in our... Maybe it's not just to do it right, but to do it right for the right reasons. Exactly, exactly. And in that sense, I would like... Uh, also... Alejandro, can I, can I add to that? Please, Hugo, definitely. I, I think it's doing it right for the right reasons so that it actually has an impact. Because we can do the right thing if it doesn't actually result in a measurable impact meaning uh, that there is uh, unimpeded, continued global research community moving forward, on the one hand, in generating uh, knowledge, and on the other hand, to make sure that uh, there is also uh, the right level of benefits shared. So I think that is an important thing. We're not doing this for, for the sake of it. We're doing it because we want to actually support the three objectives of the convention and actually to say that we actually make the contribution to conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. I think that, that's a really crucial element in, in this one. Uh, th thank you, thank you Uko, for bringing that up because uh, uh, we, we can be process oriented where we'll have a lot of processes but have no impact and the process could be for the right reasons but if we have no impact the status quo remains so we need to have a, a behavioral change. And that is why I actually said, perhaps we should be crushing our own assumptions before the circumstances crush us. Oh, I, Which I is think a it was crucial and it was already mentioned no, that we, we need to promote and provoke that transformational change. No? Um, and as a final thought from, from our side, as the UNDPGF Global ABS project, is that the, the project has created the Global ABS community as the online platform to discuss ABS issues or to provide support to providers and users. Um, and of course, this platform is, is open to anyone. And we believe we could use, as it was mentioned, as it was mentioned before by Suhel as well, we should uh, promote no, this informal dialogue to continue. And uh, from our side, the, the, the global ABS com community uh, is open for continuing that, that discussion. And in the coming days, we can uh, launch specific issues to be discussed and to, to be addressed in order to ensure that in the post-2020 biodiversity negotiations, we all get the, the ABS uh, we all need um, before concluding, and thank you for being with us, uh, we have a small surprise. Uh, Alejandro, yes. just before we go to the surprise, uh, just allow us from Secretariat to thank you and your team. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with you. It's been harrowing. Uh, we know we have been pushing each other, but it was for a good cause. And uh, we hope to continue working towards uh, in the future because with partnerships and synergies, we can achieve so much, much more. In Africa, we say, if you want to go far, walk alone. If you want to go very, very far, walk with others. As you are anticipating the closure, and definitely we need to clap and, and, and celebrate all of us uh, this conference, and, and thank you to, to all of you. I will make the, the, the final remarks on, on thanking uh, the panelists, uh, thanking, of course, the interpreters that have been with us uh, not only during this session, but in previous session, uh, Faide, uh, Vinod. And of course, uh, I have to thank uh, both uh, teams, okay? The team from the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity um, and the team of the Global ABS, uh, um, the Global ABS project um, for, for working together as one team and for making possible this uh, crazy uh, conference. Uh, I know it's a miracle that uh, some of you will continue, will remain as friends after the marathon of different sessions or after punishing you 
uh, through crazy uh, days of uh, three regional sessions in the same day. Um, but it has been uh, fantastic uh, to work with you during the preparation and during the celebration of this event. Thank you to our colleagues that prepare this uh, presentation. And that would be from our side. Thank you so much. Take care of yourselves, please. And see you soon. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Uh, Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thanks a lot.